Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me and welcome to the uh, Lunch and Learn session of webinars that we've recently restarted again with ICON. And we've got a really good number of people on the call today. So thanks very much for giving us your lunchtime break. We really appreciate it. Yeah. So we've got a really interesting, short and punchy and practical session for you today on experimentation. I'm joined by my lovely colleague, John Sketchley, who looks after all of our customers and works very closely with them on all of their implementations of iQuant. So it's perfectly placed to guide us through the first part of the webinar. And then to mix it up a bit, I'm going to take over and do the second part where we're going to do a practical hands-on session where we're going to tear down uh, the homepage of the iQuant website uh, using our own exploratory framework analysis and show you something we discovered very recently and that we're intending to address as part of our own optimization efforts. So we thought, why not actually do this on ourselves so you can see how it all works. So we'd love to have a really interactive session with you. And uh, so please get involved with questions. Uh, if you've got them, um, do thread those in throughout. We will, uh, if, if it's appropriate, we'll stop and answer those as we go. If not, we'll hold off and come to them at the right point, but please do ask questions. Uh, all of these webinars become much more interesting for everybody when there's audience participation. So um, I'm Charlie Blake Thomas. I'm CEO of iQuant, and um, that's probably all you need to know about me. Um, John, do you want to say hi? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um, to echo that, thank you so much for taking your lunch time to chat with us today. And attend this webinar on experimentation. Um, as for what I do at iQuant, a um, bit of a hybrid between obviously the account management and product specialist role. Uh, my job is to communicate with our clients, manage their accounts, make sure they're happy, make sure they're using it. Um, and at the end of the day, form these long lasting relationships where you trust us um, to, to help you guys be as effective as possible from a pre-live design perspective. Great. And John, uh, if I was a somebody sitting on this uh, webinar right now, what would you say is in it for me? Why, why should I listen to the uh, Anton Deck of the experimentation world ranting on? I think the biggest thing that stuck out for me is, is not only when people should be using iPhone, and what we really wanna make clear today is that from a predictive design perspective, that it's data before you launch. Now, in tandem with that, and what we're gonna cover today from an experimentation perspective, Experimentation is an extremely rapidly growing capability. And it's something that people have to be clued up on at the moment because it helps you be as effective as possible. And what our frameworks are designed to do is to go is to work in tandem with that to help you build knowledge firstly. So there's learning and introduce new ways for experimentation to work. And the good knock-on effect from that is that not only is it going to save you time but it's also gonna make both you and the companies that you work at much more effective in this regard. I think the biggest thing that we want to do and, and help people do is be effective, but also save time. Um, so that would be probably the standout from today. So understanding where iQuant fits into the process and getting updated with the fact that experimentation is so crucial now and becoming much more effective at that at large. Great, thanks John, that's brilliant. So. Um... If there's any questions at this point, throw them in. Um, if there's any particular areas that you'd like us to cover, then uh, throw it into the mix. If we can, we will. If we can't, we'll, we'll still tell you. So if there's something in your mind at the moment, um, and that, you know, on the call, we've got a lot of experiment, uh, experimentation experience. So if there's any questions you've got that might not fall within what you think is the scope of this webinar, that's okay too. Throw them in and we'll see if we can, we can uh, answer those for you as well, as long as it's within that sort of loose area of experimentation. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand back to John and we're going to go through the first half of this presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Charlie. And yeah, just to echo what Charlie said, I think we've all been on enough meetings in, over, in just over the past year where it feels like we're being talked at for 45 minutes an hour. And, um, you know, we really want to avoid that today. So if there's anything you guys don't feel was explained properly, if you've got any questions, please feel free to chip in as we go, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you, you get as much from this as possible. So 
what the first part of this is designed to do, and obviously those of you that are returning and attended the first webinar where we went into more detail on iQuant is I'm just gonna, and especially for the first time attendees, I'm gonna recap what iQuant is here to do and essentially how it works from a very top down perspective before we get into where experimentation fits within that pro process to help you basically understand uh, the all encompassing nature of iQuant uh, and that predictive sweet spot that we always wanna help you hit. So what's iQuant's mission statement? So our mission here is to become the de facto standard for AI guided design and data before you launch, increasing conversion rates and improving digital ROI. Right now, we are spending more time online than we ever have before. Now, obviously that is within the context of the pandemic, but also the way that naturally people are working remotely more and thus spending more time online. So you have to make sure that you're standing out. You have to convert that attention and also harness people's attention as well. So really what I want you guys to take away as sort of a headline today is that iQuant is here as data before you launch. That's the really important predictive nature of the platform and where we really want to help with your processes to again, become as effective as possible. Now, as for how it works, there's a lot of academic study behind it. So we work in tandem with the University of Osnabrück in Austria, and our platform instantly generates these visual and emotional simulations of how users will perceive anything visual that you're using to communicate with them. So a slight misconception people have sometimes is they think that it's just for website landing pages. Now, it can be used for that naturally, but any piece of visual communication you're having with your clients will have a need for icons, particularly again, in that sweet spot of being pre-live. So it's not a one size fits all tool. It's not something that just UX designers would use. It's not something that just marketing teams would use. Anyone who has that input into a visual message will have a need to work with icon, particularly again, at that design stage. We've got people who use it for online content. So digital ads, emails, newsletters, but also we have um, pizza restaurants in Italy that will use it for their pizza menus. Because again, that's a visual piece of communication. We work with Diageo, for example, who use it for drinks menus. So there is, again, that offline perspective as well. So what's important here is to remember the different ways that icon can be used across a visual medium. Now, what we've got working in the background are our artificial neural networks. And what that does is that simulates as if someone was being sat on a stool in a lab, having these different pieces of visual communication held up to them and their eye movement being tracked. And what we do is we employ this neuroscientific model of human attention and have achieved over 92% predictive accuracy. Now, the thing that I really want to mention here as well is this is not a one and done study. This isn't something that we did 10 years ago and we thought, right, that's good enough to build a basis on. It's constantly being updated by our tech team. We're constantly investigating new ways of people's attention changing. A massive one at the moment, obviously, from an e-commerce perspective, would be mobile. Because obviously a lot of people with shops being closed are now shopping online, particularly on their mobiles. So a huge piece of work we're having to do at the moment and have been harnessing um, to, to help harness that attention has been on mobile. So what I would really stress here as well is this isn't a one and done study. It's constantly being updated, the UI and the ANNs, and also it's not a one size fits all tool. Anyone that has that input into a visual communication of a message will have a need for icon. Now on top of taking that bit of attention, what do we actually help you do? Because at the end of the day, we get different bits of feedback and um, we, we always love hearing how we're helping our clients. And these are the main ways that we help our clients. So we help validate design directions. I'm sure all of you have been in some mind numbing meetings where you're debating the color of a button. Uh, someone doesn't like red, another person doesn't like blue. What we help you do is validate the direction that you're going in. And that's gonna be a big focus of today uh, with the frameworks and the idea of experimentation. We also help you use our best-in-class AI to optimize digital performance. The other one that is a huge bit of feedback that I get is reducing the time spent on subjective stakeholder feedback. So speeding up that sign-off process, being able to work quickly, efficiently, and deliver results. And another huge one is improving the digital ROI. And again, here, what we're going to focus on today is reducing the experiment and design iteration loops. 
So what would be really fantastic to really outline here would be the idea that we're here to help with, our, with your design directions. We're not here to tell you how to design, we're merely here to help as you go, nudge and guide, but let you have the freedom to create and again, be as effective as, as a possible in, in what is at the end of the day, quite a subjective endeavor at times. Can I just, um, John, just to add in to, to that, I think the one you highlighted there uh, was the subjective stakeholder feedback. Uh, having worked myself in massive companies, and I know there's a, a few of you on the call today from, from large corporates, um, hopefully this will engender a, sm a wry smile amongst you. But if you've ever sat in a, a stakeholder meeting where you've got your senior stakeholders going, well, I don't like it, or it feels wrong, or I think we should, move, why don't we move that button to the left? and using their position to assert their view. Um, you've probably all been in those meetings. If you haven't, then congratulations, I'd be very surprised. But I've certainly been in hundreds of them. And whilst the hard ROI from Iquan is there, we, we've got clients who are delivering tangible, uh, we have a client in Italy who's delivered a 56% increase in click-through rates on their homepage by using Iquan to optimize attention and uh, reduce cognitive load. So we've got those tangible ROI metrics. We've also got these softer ones that, that change the dynamic of the discussion internally, which is you're now going to stakeholders around the business with objective scientific data that's been gathered over 10 years, that your results are based on over a million data points per analysis. You really can then manage your stakeholders much more effectively and save time in the process because you're not being sent back all the time to go and make subjective changes. I just want to highlight that because it's something I've personally felt the pain of, it's something that I quant in large organizations, we have feedback from many, many groups of our customers, this making a huge difference to them. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, John, back to you. No problem, thank you, Charlie. Um, so the massive part of today as well that I really, really want to highlight um, is when you should be using I quant. Now, from a broad brush perspective, again, I have to outline, um, I'm really going to harp on about this, I'm afraid, the idea that it's data before you launch. Iquant is a predictive design AI. So it should always be used at that iteration and design stage. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it can be used within any visual medium that you're using to communicate with your clients. And that's a an, an idea that I really do want to emphasize today as well, uh, that it's not just a website tool, it's any piece of visual communication you're having. So this can include app development and optimization to improve UX, email promotion to increase CTR, website crow, increasing sales, asset creation, and of course, again, that idea of stakeholder management. So this helps you get creative assets signed off faster. I've obviously mentioned that adults now spend more than a quarter of their waking day online. That means it's so important now to stand up, stand out even, and craft compelling digital experiences. What we've done through obviously understanding that there's a lot of remote working going on, we have to look for new data-driven solutions. Um, as, as the normal sort of route, user testing and eye tracking studies are no longer an option. And what we can see in this example below, and these are our attention maps, which are being focused here. Now, we obviously have a variety of different metrics that are used when you start running analyses on iQuant. Those of you that already have access will know this. You have your clarity and excitingness scores, perception maps, attention maps, hotspots, and regions of interest. That was covered in the last webinar. If anyone who didn't attend that wants to reach out after this and either receive um, a recording of that or indeed organize some time to sit down with one of us to run through that, please do feel free. But just as these attention map here are covering, you can see that iQuant's prediction here is 91% accurate as running an eye tracking experiment with 46 participants. So there, again, there's that idea of working quickly and efficiently to deliver tangible results to you. Now, as we think here, in terms of how we can look to create compelling digital experiences, this leads us nicely into the idea of why experimenting Firstly, in design is so essential, but why it has come so strongly to the fore in the past couple of years, especially within the last year. Experimentation, as I touched upon earlier, helps you learn. It helps you introduce more efficient ways of designing. And at the end of the day, it will make you so much more efficient. And how we can do this is in three very simple steps. So we can learn, 
by testing our assumptions. If it doesn't work the first time, you know that before you have to necessarily start submitting designs and working closely to a deadline. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am not the best at working uh, when the deadline's the next day. I like to do my preparation a few couple weeks ahead. Um, but if you are working tightly, you can fail fast, which will save you a lot of time and money. And then from there, because you've learned where you've gone wrong, you can design better digital products and experiences. So again, there's that idea of using experimentation to make sure that you're performing as efficiently as possible and really learning. I think that's the biggest thing that stands out from this sort of work is, is learning constantly and improving your knowledge in this area. So this leads us nicely onto our experimentation frameworks. So firstly, what are they? They're practical, straightforward ideating templates to be filled out by you. When Charlie does the practical demonstration, you'll see that there are prompts in terms of questions to be answered. It will help you understand. And few of my clients use them almost as quasi flowcharts. So they'll say the first question is this, let me start here and work my way down and find it as a really useful guide for lack of a better word. Now, there are more manual way initially of using the platform in so far as you are going in and inserting the answers yourself in terms of typing them in. But what is fantastic about them is they help you test assumptions and answer questions about pre live designs. So it helps you pre test your hypotheses. So if you've got an idea for, uh, let's say a balance page, and in your mind, you're thinking, well, when um, someone logs on, so a lot of my finance clients work that way, when someone logs on to check their balance, um, which, you know, not necessarily speaking for everyone on the call can be quite a uh, boring endeavor, sometimes an unpleasant one. Um, if you are thinking, right, I've got a balance page and I want to put the balance in red, you can work through our experimentation to framework, our experimentation frameworks to see if that would be a good idea or not. And by pre-testing your hypotheses, you're reducing constantly looping experimentation. So you're working in a direction where you know you're moving forward. I appreciate sometimes design, having spoken to a few of my clients about this who work on the UX side of things, that it can be a very solo endeavor at times. And by reducing that amount of loop, it enables you to work more dynamically with more people and create through having that input from other people who will um, have input into any sort of visual message being more effective and iQuant is a very collaborative tool and by being collaborative you learn more and essentially the headline here is that it allows you to be creative and make efficient design decisions at the ideation stage so when you're putting the designs together and then going through iQuant you can be sure that when you're hitting that stage of putting everything through iQuant that your hypotheses are on the right lines that you're on the right lines and that you're improving your knowledge and, and at the end of the day I think what is always very pleasing as an individual is when you trust your gut, follow it, and then you're proved right. You get that confidence to make better design decisions. And when you're more confident, you become more dynamic, more creative. So it's really here to help build confidence, not only within obviously yourselves, but within the type of work that you're doing. Now, as I touched upon there, before you then move on to putting them into iQuant, the initial question is, is, well, why wouldn't I just mock something, mock something up and put it through Iquan? Because when you're putting together designs, there is a degree of stakeholder management that comes into it. Sort of, a, sort of an idea of, does this look right before I put it through Iquan? Can I get the sign off on this to go ahead and put it through Iquan? By using our experimentation frameworks, you've got quantitative data, which is going to give you that backup to then go onto the platform and start using it efficiently, because you can take the idea forward, say, this is my hypothesis, this is how I think things are going to perform. And you'll be able to leap to that stage quite quickly. Again, I'm, I am going to harp on about data before you launch. Um, what you get here is that feedback, you have a really handy piece of collateral before you launch to essentially make people trust you and trust your design decisions. It's a great starting point for the design process. And the most important thing is that, as I've touched upon, design is a very subjective and creative endeavor. What it allows you to do within those parameters, I don't want to say confines, but parameters, it allows you that freedom to experiment 
And through having that freedom, you actually get to do more of a thorough due diligence throughout that design process. It helps with things such as brand comparison. If you want to see what everyone else is doing, you can do your research based on that pre, um, pre life. Also, it will help facilitate discussion, and speed up the design process. So as I was touching upon earlier, obviously that collaborative nature, and it just helps people understand the objectives of your design. Not only are you becoming more effective, your, the standard of your communication is becoming much clearer, much better. And I think we can all agree that when we are trying to put ideas together in a collaborative environment, clarity is so important, especially in the types of communication, especially if you are working remotely over Zoom. If you can say, let me share my screen and lead you through this in two minutes and be clear and be concise in what you're saying, you will find you'll be saving so much time and working so much more efficiently. What we've got here is a bit of a visual presentation in terms of where it can fit in the process. So this is part of the onboarding presentation that I always like to use, where you can see where the life cycle of a design is, and particularly where iQuant will help you. So the real sweet spot when using iQuant is at the hypothesizing to testing stage. That's where you do all your due diligence through these frameworks. So here you would start doing your exploratory analysis. You would then build it, you would test it through A-B testing, pre-testing framework. So if you're doing A-B testing, if you're doing any multivariate testing, and this is where you will really see the idea of the data before you launch. And then through here, you can obviously start working on your brand comparison framework as well. Now you can use these frameworks, and most importantly, I quant across tools such as Hotjar or Google Analytics. The real difference here where I quant will slot in nicely is I quant tells you what will happen. The other two or sort of other tools in this toolbox tell you what has happened. What I quant allows you to do is again, there's that idea, and this is where the main idea that I want to take away from this, or sorry, that I would want you to take away from this, the when and where it fits into your toolbox is iQuant as a predictive AI works nicely with these tools to tell you what will happen. It shows you why it will happen and also will help you from there because you can preempt it, do your due diligence. And from there with the competitor benchmarking, there's that idea of understanding where you fit into a certain narrative, understanding how you can improve if needs be, and understanding how you can clearly communicate your ideas and thoughts to help you again, save time, reduce that stakeholder management, and also become much more effective at this, both as an individual and then wider as a company as well. So I'm just gonna pause there very quickly before I pass over to Charlie for the practical run through. Are there any questions at the moment? We said that we didn't want you guys to feel like you were being talked at for the entire webinar. If there's no questions, are there any thoughts? Is there anything I didn't perhaps explain correctly? I've harped on a lot about being clear, concise and giving people clarity, but I wanna make sure that I'm doing that today on the, platform, on the webinar. So if there is anything that's come up, please feel free to shoot over those questions now. Yeah, you can stick those in the Q&A section on the bottom of the webinar, you should see that. Um, so thanks, John. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, admittedly, we've gone, talked a bit about ICON there, but really only to tee this up so that you understand the context of it in terms of experimentation. So the next part is the teardown of our own homepage. We're going to use an exploratory framework. Um, whether it, I have a question really to ask yourselves is, do any of you do A-B testing now? Do any of you have an experimentation-driven culture? Or are you still doing things the let's say the old way. Um, it's amazing how we, we're very lucky to talk to uh, major brands around the world. And we've got some fantastic clients uh, ranging from massive corporations, brands, household brands, down to smaller companies uh, in single countries you've probably never heard of. But what you really learn from speaking to all these different types of companies is how much experimentation is growing, but it's just not there yet still many people many companies know they should be doing it but aren't yet and sometimes it's not knowing how to start so um, i was actually on the call with a client earlier who's a very well-known e-commerce brand and 
they were using these frameworks and we were talking through them and they said actually you know what we're going to really use this to help try and create some structure around the way we experiment because that's still very subjective and so whether or not you're an icon client uh, and on this call whether you're here to find out a bit more about it or whether you're here because you want to learn how to optimize your use of icon you can use this experimentation frameworks uh, in your business you don't have to be an icon client I'm um, very happy to share these with you. It's a way of thinking and a way of structuring your thinking. And it really starts with the premise of know what questions you want to ask first or know what your hypotheses are. Because if you start with that, then any tool you use will help you prove or disprove those. Where people um, go wrong in experimentation is one, they don't know what questions they want to ask. They just start experimenting. So it's hard to know what your outcome, whether you've been successful or not. And two is they don't document anything. And actually documenting everything from your hypothesis to your solutions to the day, almost minute when you launched the experiment is so vital. We, we had this ourselves um, uh, yesterday in a meeting. We wanted to know when we'd launched uh, a particular experiment on our own site. And we were able to check our experiment log and see exactly the day it went live and therefore analyze the data fairly. So we got clean data results. Those are some of the absolute fundamentals. And I hope these frameworks will help you with that. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and um, go from here. So I hope, John, can you just give me a thumbs up? You can see the experimentation framework. Great. So um, this particular one here, I'm just going to hide the meeting controls. This particular one is for an exploratory analysis. Um, let me show you, for those of you that haven't seen our homepage, this is our current homepage. It's very clear, simple, uncluttered, and uh, you would think that all, all is focused on that middle part. To a certain extent, that's true. But like any good company driven by conversion, we would like to improve that conversion and increase the number of people going to free trial. So these experimentation frameworks are set up in three phases. Phase one is define your experiment, set out the questions. Again, take this, this isn't about icon, this is about any experiment you're running. So please use this generically. What are the questions? What's the status quo? And that's what you need to define. And we'll run through that in a second. Phase two here in this sort of mustardy color is, uh, actually run the experiment. And then phase three is actually interpret those results. Okay, so those are the three phases. Set up the experiment, run the experiment, interpret the results. Again, a framework you can use in any experimentation process you've got going on. So if I flip back here, here's the home page. So what are we trying to do? Our engagement targets, we want to increase clicks on free trial. We want to start, we're exploring. We don't know, we haven't yet formed strong hypotheses. So we want to go and understand what some might be. Uh, we're trying to increase conversion to a contact from visitors. So we'd love to see more people getting in touch with us. Um, so I've then gone on to define the status quo here. We've got, um, three different elements that we advise you to look at when you're experimenting. So the context, what sets the scene for the user when they land on your page? If you're an re online retailer and someone lands on a landing page or you have deep linked your search so that people will land onto a product details page, what sets the context for them? Whether that's an image, whether that's text, and know what, where you want that to sit in the hierarchy. What's the motivation that causes them to want to do something? Again, that could be an imagery, it could be a piece of text, it could be something else, it could be video. But what is that motivation that causes a user to want to do something next? It could be an offer. And then finally, what is your engagement, your CTA, call to action? We call this the three Ws. What do you want me to look at? Why should I care? And where do you want me to go next? And if you can't answer those three W's from any page you're on, then you're really going to be struggling to get the conversion that you want. So in this case, the, if I flick back, 
what do you want me to look at? We want you to look at data-driven design. What's the motivation? It's the descriptive text underneath it. We want you to know that by fusing 10 years of neuroscientific study and the latest techniques and deep learning, we can help you create seamless design that's going to uh, boost your conversion. So we want to create trust with you because we have amazing data that's been you know, reviewed over many years by very well-known and thought-of scientists. So that is our motivation. And then the engagement, what's the CTA? The CTA starts a free trial. Okay, so let's move on. Um, target markets for our ideal customers. And um, we get a lot of traffic from organic search. Um, how recognizable is the brand? Well, I'm pretty honest about that. Barry, we're not Apple, um, but we are building up a great name for ourselves in this particular sector. So that is set up. So now I need to go and run the test. And this is where iQuant comes in. So now I've set up my questions. I'm now going to log in. And I, one I did, if those of you that are in the UK and are familiar with Blue Peter, then you'll know the phrase, here's one I did earlier. Um, and I can immediately start getting a, a read on how well the current design is doing. Um, so data-driven design, this is a perception map, and this is showing, I can ask the question here, is the key content on the page going to be noticed or not in the first three seconds? And in this particular design, we've got very little content going on outside of that. We've got the navigation, we've got a call to action in the top right, but mainly the eyes drawn to the middle. So really there's no surprises there, which is good. The perception map shows me that that is where, what people will notice. And actually we say up to three seconds, you've got about 50 milliseconds to grab attention. So think about now, if you're designing a challenger to this in Figma, or Adobe XD, you can test that design, pre-test it with Icon, because you might decide to introduce photography, for example, or other imagery. And you can answer the question, has this distracted from the key context and motivation and call to action on the page or not? You can learn that before you launch. So perception map, things seem to be okay. Design metrics. Another thing, mistake that uh, people often make when they're designing is they introduce too much cognitive load. So uh, cognitive load results in high bounce. In other words, think about a time when you've gone to a website and you've looked at it and gone, oh my God, I can't be bothered. That is your conscious brain or your subconscious brain telling your conscious brain there's too much cognitive load here. It's too much going on. Iquant's algorithms can predict that cognitive load for you. And in this case, what we're doing here is understanding that the clarity score is very high because we've not introduced too much cognitive load. And I can quickly double check where that cognitive load is. And it's mainly in the gaps between the images and the text that's causing that. But the, the, the blue um, background is in fact um, making it very, very clear. The trade-off for us in this example is the visual stimulation. Because we've stayed away from strong photography or other imagery or lots of content on the page, the exciting score has gone down. Now these can exist at high levels together. They're not, one doesn't negatively influence the other. But uh, in this case, we've made a trade-off with visual stimulation or excitingness. So there's a potential here. I'm starting to think maybe there's more we could do visually to stimulate people to support them clicking on that start free trial. So um, now I want to see where people are looking. And what's really interesting here is I'm now starting to get a sense of something. All the attention is directed at, and that's the darker the color, is directed at this section here that I'm circling my mouse around, the image of the brain and in fact the numbers, because they're very high contrast and there's bright color in this area and there's a strong contrast with the white. So that's really grabbing attention. But what's interesting is start free trial is not grabbing attention. So it's benefiting from the attention that the other areas are getting. It's not subconsciously imprinting itself on the brain of someone landing on this page. Consciously, they're probably going to find it if they're looking because they're going to spend time. But maybe there's more we can do here to make this stand out. And that's backed up by hotspots. And hotspot shows you the focus of attention. So the middle of the circle is the focal point. The larger the circle is the likely hierarchy of which they'll see things on the page. So in this case, we predict that someone will see the um, 60 first before flowing down to uh, ending up somewhere around data at the end. But what's interesting, if you look clearly here, closely, you can see that start free trial does not have its own focal point. 
So I've now got a hypothesis. This is something we're going to test, which is how do we, and we can pre-test this. And that's the advantage of this experimentation approach. We can actually mock some things up in Figma. We can then test them with Icon. We can pre-test them and optimize until we're happy that start free trial is getting all the attention we wanted to get, and then we can launch it. And that means we can save time and not launch variants that were never going to work anyway. I don't want to launch a variant that looks better to me subjectively, but has had no impact on the attention being focused on start free trial. So if you think about your own businesses, you probably, if you do experimentation, you probably have to do MVT. You probably have to launch five versions, split your traffic across those five. And at the end of it, if you're lucky, because it doesn't always happen first time, you'll get one of them to get to statistical significance and it won't, and maybe it will win. But what about all the traffic you sent to the other variants that were never going to perform anyway? You've just got rid of that. You've stacked ranked your experiments and you've been able to save time and money because traffic equals money, particularly in large organizations where you're spending an absolute fortune on, on acquiring traffic. So I've got a very interesting hypothesis here, which means I can focus in and pre-test my designs, pre-optimize them until I'm happy. And then regions of interest here allows me to see exactly how much attention each section is getting. If I mark up here for you the context, uh -huh, let's make that a bit tighter around that, um, and the motivation here, which I will bring into about here, and then the CTA is there. I'm actually just going to show you that the hero image is getting all the pixels in this section are getting 255% above average visibility. So the average of the page is always zero. And these are nearly 300% more visible in this section than the page average. Whereas the call to action at the top here is 19% less visible than the average. So maybe there's something we can do there as well. That presents me with another hypothesis. So I've now got my data. So back to my writer. So here, I stacked rank these um, in terms of data-driven design, descriptive text, and then the button CTS one, two, and three. So, um, what I, sorry, what I did, sorry, apologies, I've jumped on one step. These were the rankings of importance. So I wanted my CTA to be number one, my motivation to be number two, and my context to be number three. So I've now done that test. What is visible in the area of influence? The main image and CTA, we saw that earlier. So that is, that's good, right? that is there. We can see that and that matches up. Um, on the attention map, I'm here now. How are the most valuable areas motivating visitors to engage? Focus is focused heavily on the imagery we have chosen. You can see that here on the attention map. This is my conclusion I'm drawing up. Uh, and this is so important when you're doing your experimentation to actually draw conclusions. Hotspots, does the visual path indicate concentrated or diffused focus? So you can see from hotspots here that attention is focused. It's not diffused. These hotspots aren't spread across the page. They're all in one area. So arguably that's positive. But remembering back here, my hierarchy was three, two, one. The actual hierarchy is one, two, three. So the opposite way around. So my CTA is getting three. So what I've concluded, of course, is now I've got some insight. I can start playing around. And by the way, we made informed decisions when we launched this because obviously we pre-tested everything with Icon but we focus very, very heavily on our visual design. We wanted to test to see whether or not that visual design could lead to the conversions we wanted. But now, like any site, once you've made your decisions to go live, because we just we, we launched a new site and about 18 months ago, we've now got baseline data. So now's the time to come back and look at some of the things that we previously overlooked and made decisions on for other reasons, and now to try and find opportunities to improve. And that's where I want in this terms of this uh, exploratory analysis is really, really helping us because we can then use it to identify new opportunities with our own site. And secondly, and probably more importantly, 
as John went on about, is generate data before you launch. Because we can then test this, we can have our designers build mockups for a new homepage, pre-test an icon and get results and optimize before we launch. And of course, you can't do that really unless you sit down with users and do proper lab-based testing or uh, task-based testing. We use something like Validately or UserZoom, which are many of our clients use, which gives you actual users on the end of a, uh, a conference call to test with. Um, many of our customers are using iQuant to, to concentrate down what they take into those testing sessions. So they're being as efficient as possible with those because iQuant takes eight seconds to get your result. And you know, something like uh, we're using humans can take 24, 48 hours at best up to a week, two weeks at worst. Um, so here, what I've been able to conclude immediately is that my hierarchy goal, my actual goal completely in reverse. And so now, if I was in a large business presenting my stakeholders, I could quite simply come to Icon. I can download my stakeholder management pack here, um, which has all of this data already in it. I've now got my experimentation framework that shows my logical order of thinking. I combine the two. I'll just show this to you here so you can see what it looks like. Um, so all of this data is downloaded automatically for you with explanations. Here's the report. And you can even see that we add in the things I've marked up at the end there. So you've got that, you've got your experimentation framework, thinking about all the questions you wanted to ask and your conclusions. You've got the results of that. And now if you've done your pre-testing, you've also got your recommendations ready to go. And they've been pre-optimized before you launch. Um, and so that is one of the experimentation frameworks. I'm not going to spend time going through the others now. You're welcome to, uh, we can email these to you after, make it possible for you to download them. We have uh, one that, this is exploratory. So this helps you find new opportunities. We have the uh, A-B testing framework that lets you compare your own variants as early as a high fidelity wireframe. So again, if you're using Figma, Adobe XD, Photoshop, whatever you're using, you can create your high fidelity wireframe uh, as a designer with your ideas. You can then pre-test and validate those, optimize again, do all of that, and you know, do 10 times before lunch, if you like, till you get to something that's really spot on. And then when you go live, you've got the best chance of success. And I, as I referenced earlier, uh, we have one of Italy's largest energy suppliers as a customer via one of our customers, via an agency, and they redesigned their, they've got 10 million customers, they redesigned their homepage using only iQuant's metrics, they use the attention map, and they use the clarity score, and they got a 56% incre increase in click-through rate on their main call to action on the page as a result of pre-testing and pre-optimizing. They got that within 24 hours of launching because they got rid of all the other issues beforehand that I ended out. And that's one of the big takeaways from this, is if you can get that done in your experimentation, get that done early, you're more likely to have successful experiments going forward. So just to conclude, and then please feel free to stick any questions you like in the channel and, uh, and we can answer them. Um, whatever, whether you're a client of Icon or not, whether you ever become a client of Icon or not, when you take go away from this call, if you are thinking about implementing or are implementing an experimentation-led culture in your business, it's so important to have the frameworks and processes in place to support it. Um, to one story for you very quickly is that there's a major travel website. Um, I won't name them, uh, but you'll know them. You'll have used them. They run at any given point 2,000 concurrent experiments. And they have a team of 85 people in experimentation alone. To get to that, you have to have a solid underpinning of frameworks and process. So experimentation is not just about the culture and the attitude, it's about the operations that sit behind it. And these are these tools and others that you'll look at, whether it's um, this framework or other frameworks, um, are there to help you put that in place so that you can be more effective and keep control of your experimentation. So uh, yeah, in order to get the most for those Icon customers on the call, in order to get the most from Icon, we definitely recommend using these sorts of frameworks to help to help you. And, and John is available as we all are to, to help you continue to get value from these. So yeah, that's it. That's me done. Um, 
do you um john any points or any questions have come up no i think you've um covered that really brilliantly i think um what i have been harping on about your right is that idea of data before you launch i think that's so important for that to be one of the main takeaways from today and how you can harness the power of both the frameworks and then icon itself to help you make these effective design decisions um we do have a question um uh, from gosha um it says hello for reasons of interest how are these calculated or estimated uh charlie do you want i mean i don't mind i can cover that one you can cover that one however you feel would work best i'll i'll let you field it okay fine um so yeah thanks very much for the question really appreciate getting involved um so the way it's calculated is it looks at the the algorithm looks at the um average visibility of every pixel and then on the page and so then what it's doing is it's also then looking at the uh, attention on the page and then what it does is it calculates the visibility of each pixel relative to the average within the region that you generate. So when you add a new region, you expand it to cover the area you want. Within that, there's a given number of pixels and it knows the amount of attention that each of those pixels is getting. And then it gives you that score and it can tell you that relative to the average, which is zero. So that's what it is, that's how it works. So you, you can answer the question things like, how much more visible is this login button or this add to cart icon than the call to action on the bottom left of the page, for example? Um, or how much more attention does this image get than that image? Is attention equally distributed across these three product images? And of course, as John said, you can get that at the design phase. You don't have to launch for that, you don't have to wait. Um, so it might be that you particularly want to draw attention to a sale that you're running or uh, a new product you're launching, um, then you can figure that out using regions of interest beforehand. I hope that answers your question. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we're very much now within the questions part of the presentation, but what I will do is I will share my screen very quickly to, I suppose, sum up what Charlie was saying, especially with the frameworks, so that we have sort of a bit of a conclusion to everything today. So Charlie very rightly went through all three of them, and it helps you understand and answer these questions. So who the engagement target is, the problem that needs to be solved, and helps you again, these three things here that are so important to understand, context, motivation, and engagement. As Charlie mentioned as well, you can use our metrics to help you do the iQuant analysis efficiently. So there's that idea of harnessing the perception and attention maps, the hotspots, and also the visual hierarchy results in terms of how these key elements are performing with the reasons of interest data to help you understand, obviously, the numeric value and ranking of the design uh, metrics, but also visitor emotion as well through the clarity and excitingness scores. And then from there, you can interpret your results. So the attention budget, the hierarchy of fixation and how the visual hierarchy compares with your goals. As I said earlier, design is a very subjective and creative endeavor. And what these experimentation pieces of framework allow you to do, allow you to be creative, but also allow you to work efficiently as well. The biggest thing to take away from today is that iQuant is predictive design AI. It's data before you launch, but a massive part of it as well is understanding how, as we said earlier, experimentation is a rapidly growing part of the design process and how through doing this work, you can really work efficiently, quickly, save yourself time and become more confident in the types of design decisions that you want to make. So that caps off everything that we wanted to obviously run through on this webinar today. I think with this in mind, and again, with that idea of interactivity, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to send them our way now. Um, what we're here to do is obviously help outline the purpose of iQuant and the purpose of these frameworks, but also to answer questions. Um, if you don't have any questions at the moment, what you're more than welcome to do is to get in touch with us directly if you're not an existing client 
to set up a call with one of us, or even if you are, you'll know me as your account manager anyway, and you're more than welcome to reach out to me to set up another call. Um, part of a huge thing that we're doing at iQuant this year is the idea of support packages. With people working from home, we know how important it is to understand the information you're being presented with so that you can communicate it efficiently. And a big part of that is sitting down with our users and our clients to help them put into context the type of feedback that they're getting to help them work as um, efficiently as possible at the end of the day. Um, are there any questions that are coming up at the moment at all, John? No, nothing's coming up. So um, just give people another 10 seconds. If there's something on your mind now, yeah, um, just drop it in uh, to the Q&A on the bottom right of the webinar um, and we'll answer it. But otherwise, I'll just start to wrap up. We can always pause if someone drops a question in, but yeah. just to say thank you very, very much for your time. We'll continue to do these. We bring in guest speakers from other organizations as well. We've had Envision on these calls before. We've had Aviva. Uh, we've had all sorts of uh, different and interesting people talking, far more interesting than, uh, than John and me. Um, but we will be continuing to push these forward. Um, and finally, thank you to our uh, amazing customers who have joined the call. We really appreciate you and uh, thanks for taking the time to listen in. And thank you to anybody new that's uh, turned up to hear about what we've got to say. And um, as John said, if you want, to, if any of you would like to be in touch with us for any help or support, then we're, we're here for that. So um, no more questions have popped up. So without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll close the call and wish you all a happy weekend as of tomorrow. Perfect, guys. All right. Well, everyone take care and we, uh, we look forward to catching up with you all soon.